because I know folks who couldn't make it tonight did want to still come back and watch this meeting. So we'll be recording this meeting and then I'll be posting it on the, the CAC website and then we can circulate it back to everybody. So, and then Eric Brown and Angie Tennyson will be joining us a little bit late because they've got, I think their kiddos are, are at uh, activities that they're going to be coming home from. So uh, Jim, I guess if you want to, yep. you're the, in place of board chair, uh, Danny, it's all you. Thanks. Welcome, everyone. And uh, I think Commissioner Tabor probably is going to be zooming in. Um, I think he might be in Molokai, so who knows uh, with the connection. Um, and I, yeah, and we haven't heard from Jody either. So uh, this is going to be a, a break and a in a break. So the CAC's kind of done some non-traditional um, work and and listened and has been a sounding board uh, for the department on season setting. And and we've always had a little bit of that since we created the CACs years ago. And the first one was here in Kalispell. And but it but we really retooled and emphasized that we're kind of rolling back at least temporarily to where we were originally, where we want to hear what you are hearing in the communities and also provide you a presentation on a topic that's of interest. And ironically, um, uh, Pat Van Eymeren, who was very interested in this topic as a member, is skiing in Grand Targhee this weekend. <laughs> so he's going to miss out and he's going to have to watch the recording. And, you know, Pat has a fisheries background, but a lot of folks uh, don't realize that we have a native rain, a rainbow trout in Montana. So hopefully we have some real cool uh, science uh, to share with you. And we want to hear what you're hearing in the community. And, and also I want to thank everyone because it has been a little awkward process with Zoom and COVID and season setting and we did scoping and we did the final. So it was kind of a confusing year, but thank you for your patience. So we're going to roll back, hopefully do a little more traditional CAC role and look for an opportunity to get you in the field too. So. Cool. Well, let's go around and do introductions. Um, I'll just start with myself. I'm Dylan Tabish. Everybody I think here knows who I am. Uh, communication education program manager uh, with Fish, Wildlife and Parks. And next I see Shelly. Uh, so I'm Shelly. I live in Whitefish and I live on 40 acres and I just love uh, being in Montana. It's beautiful here. It was a dream when I was a kid. So I made it. It took a while. Nice. Thanks, Shelly. Thanks mm -hmm. for joining us tonight. Uh, Jim Vashro. Good evening, everyone. This is Jim Vashro from Kalispell. I'm not on the CAC, but I'm the president of Flathead Wildlife and a board member for the Montana Wildlife Federation. So thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for Jim joining, Jim. Uh, Corey. Hey, good evening. Uh, Corey Anderson. I live in Columbia Falls here and uh, am an outdoors person of sorts, I guess. So I really appreciate the opportunity and um, have it actually enjoyed it as tumultuous as it may seem to most. I think it's been, it's been kind of a neat process to be a part of. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for being here, Corey. Cliff. Hey everybody, Clifford Kip. I live on the East side of Kalispell. Um, I work for the Montana Conservation Corps and have served on Bob Marshall Wilderness Foundation and Foyce to Blacktail Trails boards in the past. I love it. I learned so much in each of these sessions and I'm really happy to be here. <clears throat> awesome. Thanks for being here, Cliff. Mark. Hey, everyone. Mark Christensen, also Eastside Cowspell, neighbors of Cliff. Uh, really happy to be a part of this uh, CAC. It's definitely an enriching experience for me. I'm uh, an enthusiast of all things wild, so every, every meeting is captivating. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for being here. Molly. Hey, everybody. I'm Molly. I live in Columbia Falls, and so probably by next year, living in Whitefish, we're going to do the crazy thing and maybe build this year, which seems really stupid right now, but we'll see. <laughs> um, I came here by way of Oregon and Washington and Alaska. Um, been deeply involved in outdoor recreation and whitewater rafting my whole life. Um, some mountain climbing, skiing, and come from a hunting and fishing family. So finally picked up a bow and a few uh, other firearms when I moved out to Montana. And I am currently finishing out my three years um, in my term as the Flathead Valley representative for Montana backcountry hunters and anglers as well. 
and uh, just really excited to have this continued opportunity to keep learning more deeply about our area and the issues that are most important to our region. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Molly. Thanks for being here. Uh, Mike. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> Mike Kessler. I'm the fisheries program manager for Northwest Montana, and hopefully I'll be giving Neil Anderson a break tonight and talk about something other than big game. Nice. Thanks, Mike. Neil. Hey, everybody. Uh, Neil Anderson. I am the wildlife program manager um, here in Kalispell, and I'm very much looking forward to Mike giving me a break. So. <laughs> We'll find a way to, to get you into a discussion, Neil. Neil, you got a fisheries background tonight. Are there red bands in that water body, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> Matt, go ahead. Hey there. Good evening, everybody. Matt Boyer. I'm here in the Kalispell office, and I supervise the hydropower fisheries mitigation programs that are associated with Hungry Horse and Libby Dams. Good to see wow. everybody. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Uh, Mike? Evinger. Hi everyone, I'm Mike Evinger. I'm the area biologist down in Thompson Falls. Um, I'm just here to listen and learn. Yeah, thanks for joining us, Mike. Uh, Thomas, Tom. Oh, you're muted. Tom Kagan from St. Ignatius. Thanks for being here, Tom. Uh, Martha. Some technical difficulties. <laughs> I'm Martha Brush. I'm the regional office manager for 18 and a half years there at the Kalispell Regional Headquarters. Thanks, Martha. Uh, Ron. Hello, everyone. Ron Howell. I'm the legislative liaison here in Helena. Been with the department about 15 years, and I'm actually from Ronan Region 1, so it's nice to listen in tonight. Yeah, thanks for being here, Ron. Uh, Lee. Uh, Lee Anderson. I'm the warden captain here in Kalispell for Region 1. Been uh, with FWP almost 26 years now. Thank you, Lee. And Angie. Hi there. I'm Angie. I'm Region 1 from Kalispell. Um, I think that's about it. Bye. But you got a, a daughter going off to, is it divisionals or state tournament tonight? Yeah, she's headed to divisionals. I just got back. They, we did a big goodbye for the whole teams. All the parents showed up, made them posters and snacks and all sorts of stuff. So first game is tomorrow and they'll be going through Saturday night. Right on. Go Bravettes. Yeah. It's awesome. Thanks for being here, Angie. And I yeah, think thanks. Eric Brown, I know, said he's going to be logging in here soon. So I'll try to keep an eye out for Eric and he can introduce himself um, and then a few other folks who uh, just couldn't make it here tonight. Um, well, maybe this is him coming in right now, iPad 76. Um, let's see, while that individual is logging in. Hey there, iPad 76, who's this? If you wanna introduce yourself, we're actually just finishing up introductions. Hello, mates, this is Madeline from Sydney. <laughs> Hello guys, uh, just checking in, sorry I'm late. The ferry ran late because of the incredibly bad weather. Um, I am from Eureka, Montana originally and visiting my son down under for the first time in two and a half years. So um, this meeting is special, it's pretty special for me to actually check in. <laughs> yeah, hey, thanks. You're in Sydney, Australia right now, Madeline? Yes, I am. It's, nice. uh, yeah, it's 12.40 p.m. here. So I'm six hours behind, but a day ahead. So I can assure you that tomorrow the world is still existing because I am already in tomorrow. Good. Well, that's good to hear. Nice. Well, thank you for joining us, uh, Madeline, on your, your trip down under. Um, let's see. Did I miss anybody? There's a Galaxy S10. Oh, that's Lee. Lee's got some weird setup where he's got like two different devices he operates on. Um, I'm so special. I'm on here twice, Dylan. Come on. That's that's right. Yes, he's in another galaxy. Um, well, cool. Well, I don't see Commissioner Tabor or Board Member Loomis. Normally, we would have them give an update on the commission 
and on State Parks and Recreation Board. I guess I can just kind of ad lib and Jim, you can help me. Tomorrow is the, and anybody else can help me here too. Uh, tomorrow's the Parks Board meeting. Um, you'll be able to watch it via Zoom or at our office if you'd like. It's pretty heavy with Region 1 stuff um, actually on the agenda with some really exciting things, including um, the two archery range expansions that I think we talked a little bit about in the past with this group. Those are going to be two expansions of archery ranges at one at Lone Pine State Park. We're going to expand hopefully a few acres onto that uh, archery range up there and then develop a brand new archery range at the Big Arm State Park on Flathead Lake um, and got tons of support uh, and good feedback on those two proposals. And uh, those are gonna be, I think, pretty exciting advancements at those state parks. And then Summers Beach State Park, I believe is on the agenda, Jim, right? Yes, the interim development plan. So, you know, the amenities, the temporary, perhaps permanent, depending upon what we do long-term, but uh, for your enjoyment, this summer and and right now, a garbage can, latrine, a parking lot, uh, that's on the that's on the docket, as well as a Lake Mary Ronan land exchange. We had an uh, an incursion issue, um, and we ended up working out a nice uh, resolution for the public to get more shore front um, ownership on Lake Mary Ronan. So that on, on there, and uh, I think that's it. And just as a side, I think about half of the of the uh, uh, dynamic equilibrium beach structure is done at Summers. And so that's exciting too. We're down there, Dr. L Dr. Lorang, and so working with Dave Landstrom and our crew uh, down there putting in the erosion control structure. So you'll see that Oops. soon. Uh, they, they get after it, it doesn't take them long. And it's, it's huge uh, equipment and trucks and stuff. There you go. And hopefully that'll, that'll stop the erosion that's been occurring. So lots on the parks board tomorrow. So Cliff, I know you and some others have an interest. It's at uh, 1 p.m. And, and we'll have it on the TV here at the office if you're interested too. And, yeah, any questions on parks board related topics? We will, Dave's not on here tonight, but you know, here pretty soon we're gonna be launching the long-term planning process for Summers Beach State Park. And that's going to involve uh, a pretty fun summer long process of uh, putting out a survey, asking uh, the public what they'd like to see at that brand new state park on the North Shore of Flathead Lake. Um, so what types of amenities uh, would you be interested in having at that new state park? And then we'll be having a, like an open house type event, most likely at that, uh, uh, park as well. And so we're thinking, you know, we really want to do a field trip with the CAC. Those have been really popular in the past. And, and we're thinking that might be a fun field trip that would also be really beneficial for us to get input on that project is to go tour the new Summers Beach State Park property, because it's a really neat piece of property. And, and that process to kind of basically have uh, not a blank canvas, but a, a cool new canvas to play around with and create into a new state park is going to be a fun process to go through. So we'd love input and engagement from the CAC on that one. Uh, yeah, I, would, yeah, Dylan, I just yeah. uh, was thinking, you know, today the tickets went on sale for Glacier and, yeah. you know, not everybody can get in. So wondering if there's a way to promote the state parks for people who do get here, they're not able to get into Glacier, you know, being able to promote our state parks somehow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I wish Dave, Dave couldn't make it tonight, but he would be the right person to answer or address that. You know, I know not nearly to the scale that Glacier Park experiences, we still are packed at our state parks. And so it's a fine line between, you know, promoting our state parks that are also to our version, or I guess relative to what we're used to, very crowded. You know, we actually are getting increasing number of complaints or concerns about, you know, campsites are very difficult to come by, but, but it is a good point, Shelly, to, to make sure that as much as we can spread out that volume of people. Yeah. And that, that, I mean, that was basically what I was saying is how can we mm -hmm. take this influx of people that we're getting and try to, you know, spread them out so that us locals aren't getting so frustrated too. It, uh, it's, a, in parks. it's a great question, Shelly. And, and, it's being debated right now with all the agency leaders and the tribes 
chambers of commerce, you know, even the question I've heard, do we need to advertise anymore? You know, since COVID and the climate migrants and, uh, you know, the mm -hmm. urban unrest in the large cities, all those factors combined, you know, people showed up in these Rocky Mountain towns, you know, like here and elsewhere. And how do we distribute those impacts and where do we send them? And, and I know like the Forest Service, you know, do we send them down to Hungry Horse where campgrounds used to be empty? Well, now they're full. Our parks are full. It's a July and August problem primarily. And, yeah. uh, but it's a great topic. And that may be a fun topic too to wrestle with as a group here, um, you know, uh, as well. So let's uh, duly noted <laughs> and we'll, we can revisit that. It's, it's, it's timely. And then the next Montana Fish and Wildlife Commission meeting is April 19th. So that's when our commission will meet next, April 19th. And there's not an agenda out for that yet, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll make sure and send out information on those when those are coming up. Um, so before we go into the presentation, I guess one other just like news tidbit that I would share with the group that just as interesting perhaps. Uh, yesterday was the start of our new license year, as you all know, so you can now purchase your 2022 hunting and fishing licenses and start putting in for your, all your, your permit drawings and everything. And we also this year um, debuted the new app that I th we gave this group a heads up about. And although I couldn't uh, unfortunately accommodate Molly's great request to get all of you in as testers, um, I tried, but it was kind of a bit of a scramble there at the end. We were trying to get it developed and, and fine tune all the bugs as much as possible um, before launching it yesterday uh, or actually launched Monday. Um, but I appreciate that, that offer Molly and, and we will, we're definitely going to be continuing to roll out updates and explore new functions and services that that app can provide. So please uh, any feedback you all have um, we're all ears on that. We've already been collecting some really good ideas from folks who are using the app and saying, well, what about maybe adding this function or this service? But the new app launched and in the first 24 hours, we had 5,414 people download the app. So pretty good uh, usage rate for the first 24 hours for a brand new app. So we're- Looks we're, great. It's not know, happy I'm, either. Can I make a quick comment? I was, I was trying to download the app uh, through Google Play and was unable to find it. Is that still the case? So yes, that's so the, the, the discrepancy between those 5,400 people, it's 3,700 Apple users and only 1,700 Android users, which is noticeably not how, because there's more Android actually devices out there. And it's because Google with the Google Play Store, well, for new apps, they make it really difficult to find it. Like literally some people can't even search for the name. And so you, you have to use the direct link. Some people, for some reason, when they just search Montana can find it. So it's part of the Google algorithm, the same way a new website takes a while for some reason, their, their tentacles to add it to the search engine results. And so over to, apparently they are telling us, because we've, you're absolutely right, Mark, we've heard from lots of folks saying, I can't even find it. And Google keeps telling us that, you know, don't worry, it just takes a little time for it to be meshed into the, the machine or whatever that spits it out. So if you need the direct link, though, you can find that on the, the web page for the okay. app. There's a direct link there. Um, yeah, well, it, let's see, does somebody have a hand up? It looks like I can't tell. Oh, Molly. I put my hand up, but my, my wall is very busy. Too many antlers. Um, uh, do, does the department already have plans to, for future releases, integrate purchasing into the app so that you're not just taken to the general website? I think I'm not sure if that what phase that that would be incorporated in, but I'm sure that that is probably being looked at as a possibility because you're right right now you can't buy and apply within the app it just basically opens a web browser so. Um, you know and Ron you might have more insight into that, you know they kind of we had to kind of pick and choose what was going to be part of this first release. Um, and well, so that would be a really big engineering lift I understand that I was just wondering if it was in the cards eventually. Yeah, I, that's all I know too, Dylan, is that it's just things are coming in phases, but lots of things, lots of, you know, reporting stuff, all kinds of stuff are being discussed. So hopefully this is the future of where we're headed for sure. Yeah, and I know the plan that we've we've heard from our commission and, and our leadership's really interested in is uh, incorporating even by this fall, hopefully, uh, some level of mandatory har hunter harvest survey reporting 
through the app. So, you know, that's something we've heard for many years that hunters are interested in. And so um, they're still kind of working through those details to figure out exactly what that process will look like for uh, basically providing the same type of information you get if you get the phone call after the season. Um, but that's, that's being explored right now too, is a, is an update down the road. So, um, but yeah, please, if you play around with the app and you're free on into anything, like what Mark said, please let us know. Um, you know, one of the, I guess I would say the, the hiccup we've seen so far, not to a large degree, but some folks are getting confused by that term validate. And so they're validating their e-tags like right now, thinking that it's part of like downloading the, the, the tag. And so we've had some folks, unfortunately, validate their e-tags. And so we're rushing through a, a, an update to that language now. So it'll say validate harvest. And so here in the next day or two, that should update as long as you make sure to update your iPhone app or your app. Uh, so to clear up any confusion around what validate means, we don't want folks accidentally validating their harvest right now. <laughs> but yeah, we had a few a few deer go down Monday. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that, with that, uh, any other kind of random uh, housekeeping items before we dive into Mike's presentation, Jim? Anybody? Uh, just that, if <clears throat> excuse me, Commissioner Tabor does jump on let's uh we can uh, have his update later yeah uh, because there's a time shift i think between here and where he's at uh, not so much as as uh madeline but uh yeah. there's a time delay nonetheless so yeah oh, there's eric eric's logging on too i can see that oh nice perfect well we'll give eric a sec to log in and eric thanks for joining us sorry to jump on you right as you join us eric but we're just about to go from introductions into the presentation. So you want mind introducing yourself? Sure, this is Eric Brown of Kalispell, just driving in here. Thanks cool. for joining us, Eric. And, and Dylan, Neil Anderson's on. So those of you that have questions about hunting related changes, we can always hold those uh, till later, later too. And Neil, perhaps you can answer what you can anyway. So thanks. Yeah, perfect. So we'll go to Mike's fisheries presentation next and then after that presentation, we'll obviously have questions and answers and then go to a, just a general round table where we'd love to just hear from all of you, uh, topics on your mind, questions you may have, observations, anything like that. So, uh, but first Mike, go ahead. It's the floor is yours. Okay, thanks Dylan. <clears throat> so yeah, uh, my father-in-law who's kind of been, he's kind of known, had been known at times to say, strange things. One of his sayings was, once you get there, then you're there. And I, I was like, what the, what are you talking about? Well, we're going to find out right now because now I'm going to try to share my screen. Am I close? Yep. Yeah. Right on. And I'm also going to take my face off the screen, I think. Well, maybe I can't now. So this is, this is, this little fish is kind of near and dear to me. I spent a lot of years in the Kootenai, um, the largest portion of my career there and got to know this, this little dude pretty well. And I, you know, I, I kind of sometimes, maybe not so much from you folks, but uh, when we start talking about native species, I sometimes get this, you know, oh God, there you go again. You're talking about you're talking about native species. Why aren't, why don't you talk about something that everybody goes to fishes for? Well, there, there's there's a reason why these native species are are kind of important. And uh, as an example, um, in uh, in region one, I don't know of any any non-native species that are imperiled where they are. In fact. You know, kind of at a minimum, they're pretty stable, and in some cases, they're increasing. The examples are, you know, some of the uh, warm water species, uh, smallmouth bass, northern pike, crappies. Well, they're they they are pretty much everywhere. They don't they don't really need our help um, to keep to keep keeping on. Um, it, you know, and it. So I'm going to get on a bit of a soapbox here that. Uh, we started looking for illegally introduced species in the state in around 1953, which is about when fisheries biology got started. 
And uh, for this region, region one, um, which is kind of the hot spot, since 1953, more than 400 illegal introductions have occurred in over 140 water bodies. So we've, they're doing just fine. And as, you, as you'll see, as I, as I move forward, you, you can't really say the same for these. So, so now we're, we're gonna, let's just move forward. That was my soapbox. So how do you get there? Well, what's the, let's, let's start with what, what is a red band? Um, fish have been around in, in, on the earth for some, something like 400 million years. And they were fish before there was anything else. And they just kind of, they just kind of dawdled around in the oceans for a long time and uh, started creating other things as they were moving along. And right around 5 million years ago, we got in the, the their, these fish kind of evolved into this precursor for what, what we now know are salmon. And then right around then, the salmon, they kind of split in between the, the, uh, the Pacific salmon that you guys know about and probably fish for and a trout. And then move a little bit farther forward, but you know, our, some of our iconic species, the West Slope cutthroat trout and Yellowstone cutthroat trout, the steak fish, well, that, that, that was around 2 million years ago that they separated from the rainbows. Now, rainbows, that makes rainbows pretty, and they had, and the cutthroat never really changed much after that. It was the rainbows that really started to radiate more. Um, and that happened during these glacial epochs or, you know, 80,000 to 12,000 years ago. And, you know, kind of, you got to think, you got to think about glaciers and how they, how they affect the ground. And it, you know, so what happens is they come out, they're exceptionally heavy, they compress the ground. And when they, when they, when they move back, you hear things about moraines and, and they gouge out places. And, and, and during that time, there, was, there were these separations, there were inland seas and there were, there were, there were the big oceans. And, and those, that's about when these things really started separating with coastal rainbow trout being along the west side of the, of the Cascade Mountains and then north, north into British Columbia and Alaska and, and down into uh, coastal California. And the inland rainbows start, they evolved farther in east of the Cascades. And you'll see the little blip there on, in Montana. So they, they kind of, the, the, way, the way they evolved is in three different, three different forms. Um, there was probably the original one coming from the ocean, going into fresh water. Um, that's the, uh, the, uh, the inland steelhead. That's if you've, if you've gone fishing in the snake or the clear water for these creatures, that's what you guys have caught. They came in a little bit farther and a few of them found some really cool places, deep water lakes where there were kokanee in them, kokanee that, that evolved with them. And they, they said, well, I'm, I'm gonna stay here. And these are the Gerards or the Kamloops that you've heard about. They, they, they are late maturing, meaning that they don't spend time making eggs and sperm until they're around six or seven years old. So they spend their first several years doing nothing but growing as big as they can get. And these, oh, by the way, are native to the Kootenai drainage. And then, our, then there's ours, our Montana. It's the Columbia Basin red band trout. Now these, these, are, these are resident, um, all in streams, although there's some, uh, there's some history newspaper clippings from the turn of the 19th century that suggested that there was a, a trout in Kilbrennan Lake up by Troy that uh, was before there was stocking. So it's possible that, that there was a lake one too. Not very big fish, 10 inches is a, is a, is a granddaddy and that 10 inch fish may be as old as five years, five or six years. Uh, one of the things that they, that kind of separates them it's not perfect, but uh, what we see, at least in, in where they're native to Montana, is they tend to be green, green, yellow, red. And uh, a little bit later, uh, you'll see, a, you'll see a, a picture of a, a coastal rainbow. They tend to be 
purple, blue, and red. And so, so you can kind of tell the part. They, they, they have par marks for life. Um, the coastal rainbows don't. And then that, uh, if, if you've caught them at the right time, that red band that you see there along the lateral line, that gets really exaggerated. The interesting things about this fish, the red band, is, is their, their habitat diverse. Now, what does that mean? Well, when you think about something like a cutthroat, they, you, you talk about cold, clear, high, high in drainages kind of a species. Well, well, these red bands can certainly exist there, but they, they are also in places that have some pretty hostile temperatures, um, you know, pushing that 70 degree mark. So they're, they're, they're very temperature tolerant. They, they, they're said to have a convergent evolution with West Slope Cutthroat Tongue. So what does that mean? So they, they grew up, they grew up in different places, but, but where they did cross over, they, all the places that cutthroat exist, so do red bands. They can exist in the same, the same situations. Not, and in, oh, by the way, there are places um, like in the Yak, uh, the West Fork of the Yak down below the falls where where a West Slope cutthroat trout and a red band can exist together and they don't hybridize, which is, which can't be said for uh, when uh, coastal rainbows are involved. So this is, this is kind of a, kind of a, I think a kind of a neat description of, uh, of, of what these two fish look like generally, nothing is perfect, but you see that, that pink, um, bluish tinge on on the coastal rainbow on the top and the green the green and red and yellow of the uh, of the red bands on the bottom okay so now we know we know a little bit about what they are so where are they um so i talked about you heard me talk about the evolution as, as little as i possibly could because i you know that's all speculation but it looks like the way these things um, moved in is, is during these glacial epochs, um, when, the, when the glaciers receded, there were these gouges um, in the kind of the interior west of the country. And that's where those inland rainbows, they, they, they are down as far as uh, Utah and uh, Cal uh, farther south in California. And, it, and based on the information and, and uh, supposition that we have, uh, it looks like they've kind of, they kind of moved their way up and followed the glaciers up. And oh, by the way, the cutthroat were already there. So a, a kind of a brilliant character, Robert Benke uh, wrote a treatise on uh, native, native uh, trout of Western Montana. And he described all the, all the distributions of, of all the, all the Western trouts. There's a, quite a few species and subspecies of cutthroat and same thing goes for, for the rainbow trout. And based on what he knew at the time, he, he, he determined, he, he said, okay, Kootenai Falls, because there was no real barrier between Kootenai Lake uh, and Kootenai Falls, Kootenai Falls must have been the up, uppermost um, distribution for this fish. Well, so, uh, I don't know if you can see, I can't see it on mine. Um, so in this, this uh, picture, there, you see a bunch of dots. So that, that represents um, samples we took from fish in those streams. And it, it started around in the mid seventies and, and, and that represents almost 400 samples. So uh, from that, and, and I, and I, Genetics are, it's like electricity to me. I, I know it works, I just don't know how. Um, we came up with a new distribution. So it turns out that Kootenai Falls wasn't the uppermost, wasn't the barrier to migration for these fish. And we were finding them in the Libby Creek drainage and in Fisher drainage also. It's, what's strange is that we never really found them upstream of where Libby Dam is right now. Um, of course, Libby Dam wasn't there 10,000 years ago, but it, I, I think uh, an, 
you know, at least my explanation for it is that right around that site where Libby is, is a fault. And you go back to these glaciers are really heavy. And when they recede, the land rebounds. And it doesn't all rebound at the same, at the same rate. So it's possible when, when these uh, red bands were, were uh, moving into, these, into the drainages, there might have still been a barrier right there. So we can take it a step farther. We're getting better and better at, our, uh, at, at the, the information that we get from genetics. I mean, you guys hear the supercomputers and, and uh, uh, DNA. I mean, it's, it's mind boggling what they, can, what they can do with it. And, and from that, we now have at least the start of what, what's the current distribution. So those peach colored blobs there are the places where, uh, well, around 1995, um, that we determined that's where there are um, red bands now compared to where they were historically. Take it a step farther, and our most recent most recent analysis is that it's it's not even it's not even like that. So what we what we do as a standard is uh, from our genetics work. We look for places that have these red bands in them that are less than 10% hybridized with other species. And, and really the other species we're talking about is, uh, is that coastal rainbow trout. And it turns out that the, the distribution is less than 20% now what it was historic. Okay, so what? So there's a lot of words here, but you guys, this is all old hat to you when you, uh, when he got on the, the CAC, uh, Dylan gave you a, a the Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks vision and guide, and I'm sure you guys read it cover to cover. Um, what it is for us is it provides us direction for our management, and it's for fish and wildlife. And the things I kind of wanted to point out was, you know, the first part is that you know, it's our commitment, fisheries commitment is to conserve, protect, enhance fish, wildlife populations, habitats, and the public's opportunity to enjoy them. And, and how we get to there? Well, the, the kind of the big one is to the restore, maintain, and protect the native species and their habitats. And still remembering that we're, we're protecting, yes, but the whole, the, the end game is to protect them so that they can be, they can be enjoyed including angled by the Montana public. Okay, so now another so what? Well, now let's we'll create this, we got a plan. We know the historic distribution. We identified the current distribution, check, check. And we are right now, we protect, main, maintain the populations that are existing as we know. So, okay, well, what, are, what, what would we do to restore them. Well, first off, you need fish. So there's only two, there's only two ways to do this. You, you either have to transplant and take them out of one place and put them in another, or figure out how to make, how to get them into a hatchery system and, and stock them out of a hatchery. So like I said earlier, these are not big fish. 10 inches is a big one. Um, and they're really, there, there are not enough places and there are not enough fish that we would take them directly from one stream and, and put them into another or from a stream and put them into a, um, a lake somewhere. So hatcheries is, is, is gonna be the answer. It has to be the answer. Well, there's a state policy where we will not put wild fish into a hatchery. And, and there's, a, there's some very good reasons for that, not the least of which is uh, disease concern. The last thing we want is to take, take 100 red bands, put them into a hatchery, and, and all of a sudden we have a disease and, and a million fish have to be sacrificed. So we have a solution, maybe. Um, Libby Hatchery, and this is, this is for Angie. 
this is her old country right next door, although I'm pretty confident she doesn't remember it looking like this. Uh, this is a 1960s photo of it. Um, it was a it was a hatchery that was it was well used. Um, it it was cold cold water, so we didn't really get a lot of big fish. It was hard to grow them big to stock them out, and uh, there was a few disease concerns. So in about 1979, they decided we're not going to use this anymore. We the department abandoned that hatchery. This is what's left. Um, but that's okay. This is not connected to our hatchery system. Essentially, it's an isolation facility. We can bring fish from the wild and put them in here and, and let's see if we can grow them and, and uh, can, we, can we get them to reproduce? Well, it turns out that, yeah, we can, we can get a five inch fish in two years to get to be about 12 inches. That's good. That's, that's still, there's not enough room there to be able to produce enough fish to be able to put them into the places where we think we might want to do that. So what we did is we, we, spawn, we spawn those smaller fish. Um, that 12 inch female gave out about 150 eggs. Um, and uh, when they were fertilized, we then, we took them to Murray Springs Fish Hatchery, which, by the way, was the replacement for the Libby, Libby Fish Hatchery. Murray Springs is up, in, up by Eureka. So this is what we found out, that, well, by golly, it works. So they, they did all the things that you want a hatchery fish to do. They, they, ate, they ate our fish food. They, they, they grow as big, or if, if not as big, even a little faster than the domestic fish that we have in the hatchery system. They, they very good eggs. Um, one of the interesting things about Murray Springs is was, was fin erosion was an, was an issue there. And, and we don't know, you know, that's a nipping thing. Um, and, and a lot of it also has to do with how old, a, how long a, um, a strain of rainbow or cutthroat has been in a hatchery. You know, they just, they're, they, they lose condition. Um, and, you know, a typical hatchery fish, they kind of fade, fade out at around four years. These, these fish were living um, five and six years, and we had a couple at uh, Libby, Libby that lived to be 10 years old. Okay, so here's back to the plan. Lots of, lots of check marks here. Hatchery success right on. Well, so if we want to, if we want to, well, we need to get public buy-in. You know, if we're going to put these, if we're going to replace some fish in some lake with these, we want to be able to say, you know what, this is going to work um, because we tried it somewhere and, and, and here's why. So we did a strain evaluation, Pick, picked a medium-sized lake, a small lake, and a bigger lake, a bigger deep lake that that had uh, that has kokanee in it, and the the idea there was that remember back earlier I talked about cousin Gerard, well, well these red bands are genetically very similar, so there was we were thinking well maybe just maybe we can get these things and we'll have a fish that that'll be a pice for it'll be a very we can we can put it in all kinds of situations. Well, it turns out that. Uh, these things work really worked really well in the small and medium sized lakes. Um, very catchable. This is you know this is a good growth. This is a I think like a 17 inch fish, and after he'd been in there for three years, and they this is Kilbrennan Lake, and it was a really for a while it was a very popular fishery. Um, turns out you know they're I'm not supposed to say stupid um, naive is probably the word they're fairly they're they're easy to catch like a cutthroat but when you get them on the end of the line they act like those rainbows that if you've been in the madison river or, or in any other places where you we fly fish for those rainbows they they kind of come unglued a lot of fun really neat really neat fishery um they're not a fish eater though so we're not gonna we're not gonna be put the, putting them in lakes where we expect them to grow to big trophy 
trophy size fish. The other issue maybe is we're not sure, we're not sure how well they do in competition or in the same place as brook trout. Um, they, in this Kilbrandon Lake example, they did pretty well um, as the brook trout population was expanding back. But brook trout have that nasty ability to, to overpopulate and stunt and, and uh, lots of little fish. And, and it doesn't seem like these, these red bands do really well in that competition. So checking off a bunch more stuff here. We got, we got that historic distribution, current distribution. We can, we can raise them in a hatchery. We've, we've put them into situations where there's recreational fishery and, and they've been successful. So now, okay, the kind of the, I guess you'd call the final step. If, if, we're, if we want to conserve this population or restore it to at least some of its um, historic distribution, we've got to find where we're going to do it. So going back to that genetics picture with the 400 dots on the map, we identified the places. This happens to be lakes in the cabinet uh, in the Cabinet Mountains, some in wilderness, some not, um, where the downstream populations historically were, were red band. And these, uh, these are the places that we, that we would put forth. And this is where, this is where CAC really comes in handy um, because it's, if we're gonna do these things, it's gonna require a lot of public engagement. You know, that's, it, it's critical. If, you know, if nobody wants it, then there's, it's hard to justify doing it. Um, but, and these aren't the only lakes that, that are a possibility. Um, there's some in the Yak um, and, and a couple other places. So that is what I had to talk about. And if you guys have any questions, um, I, you know, I'd, let me let me let me back up just a little bit, not just on this, but I'd say, Dylan, you know, all things fish are up for grabs. If I can't answer it, I, I'll find someone who can get back to you guys. But yeah, yeah, that's perfect, Mike. Yeah, thank you. And and yeah, the way I'll just set the stage and then it looks like Shelly has a question, which is great right off the bat is that, like Mike said, you know, we need public buy in for any of our projects. Um, so really, uh, you got kind of a sneak peek at, at, at something like this, and I would just love, and I, all of our staff would love to just get your thoughts. What resonates about this project? What, what questions would you, do you have? Are there any concerns that come to your mind? Um, really, this, this is a, an opportunity for us to also kind of hear what's going through your mind when you hear a project like this so that we can help um, inform our decisions and processes moving forward. So so but that was great, Mike. Thank you very Bill, much. Before, before we move forward and before I take the unshare, um, this is this happens to be the state record rainbow trout. That was that's Jack Housel. If anybody has lived in Libby, probably knows who he is. Um, he was 38 inches long and uh, 33, a little over 33 pounds, and seven years old. Uh, Anybody take a guess as to whether that's a coastal rainbow or a red band? I will tell you, it is a red band. And the reason I know it is because I was, when I was talking about fin erosion in, in Murray Springs, one of the things that shows up with hatchery fish is if you look at their dorsal fin, they tend to be a little bit wobbly. Well, this dude had a wobbly dorsal fin. So we didn't even have to guess. That, that is a red band. Now, let's see. That's a beauty. And, and? <laughs> and there's, there's Manny. Awesome. Well, thank you, Mike. Well, uh, Shelly, go ahead with your question or comment. <clears throat> well, a couple questions. I was wondering, um, wintertime, what do these fish need to do? Do they need to go deep uh, during winter? And then the other one is, uh, what is the qualifications on where to locate them? Because there's a lot of fishing that goes on around here in whitefish. 
Oh, okay. So let's see. Let let me back up a little bit. The the first was, were you asking about warm water or or cold water winter time? Where so did... they they're trout are really tolerant to cold water. Um, if 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 there's a place to be, yeah, if it doesn't freeze solid in most of the streams, the majority of the streams in the Kootenai drainage where these exist are are kind of uh, groundwater influenced. So they, they, these are the places that tend to be cold in the summer and warm in the winter. So we don't typically have big issues with freezing. The one, the one uh, um, caveat to that is Wolf Creek, the Wolf Creek drainage gets really hot. I mean, it's 70 plus degrees in the summer and in a lot of places it freezes. And, and they're, you know, they're, they're not stupid. Um, they know when they're starting to run out of water. Yes, they, they, will, they will move up or they will move down. And they, they, tend, they tend to find these pools that are uh, permanent, permanent water throughout the year. Um, and and I, you know, one of the things they'll do is, you know, fish will eat all year long, but, but they'll eat a lot less in the winter. I mean, it's all based on the conditions. Um, now, the second part of the question, what qualifies for where you want to relocate them? What so, the type of lake you're looking for? Right. As 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 far as so there's there's two possible two three possibilities kind of you know one would be in a stream in a lake and then where which lakes so we are we will we will not put these particular fish say into the flathead drainage in lakes that are open systems. So open to streams, you know, you've heard it, you probably hear it ad nauseum. Um, the flathead drainage of the last best place, which is Montana, is the last best place for West Slope cutthroat trout. So we will, we won't, even though they don't intergress with them, they don't hybridize with them, it's the, those are the kind of places where we won't put them. And like I said with that map, um, they had the circles on it, where we chose to say, okay, this is where we'd like to put them. Those streams down below, they're connected, all of them. Those streams down below are where we, they're either our existing um, red bands or historically there were red bands. And then, you know, there, we don't have, there's no issue putting a red band in a lake by whitefish that's a closed basin lake. We already put rainbows, the coastal rainbows in those kinds of situations. So if the, if the, if it, the opportunity presented itself, that, that would be a place if we were going to, to go into production beyond conserving them. Great, thanks for the question, yes. Shelly. Um, Molly, you have your hand up. My first thought, um, well, thank you for the awesome presentation, Mike, and the really fun pictures too along the way, <laughs> um, particularly the last one. <laughs> um, <laughs> My first thought was of the Elk River Valley and tech mining and selenium. Can you talk about what you know about the current crisis in that state and what this will mean for your restoration ambitions? Right. Um, so the simplest thing to say is that it's complicated. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's two different countries. Um, and it's a it's a multinational business um, that has they've been able to do just about what they want to do. Now um, it's not going to restoration recovery of native species isn't just red bands. So if you remember from that that um, distribution map. Red bands don't, their, their, their historic and current distribution is not up into the north, the north end of the Kootenai River drainage, but Wessel cutthroat trout are. And it does have pretty serious impacts to Wessel cutthroat trout in, the, in that Elk River, River drainage. So we don't stock wild fish into streams. We, we, it's, just, it's just our policy, what we, what we do 
What we will do though is advocate for, for getting the highest quality habitat in those streams so that the fish that are there can um, thrive. That's, that's where we sit right now. That is, that is where um, DEQ is, the Montana Department of Environmental Quality. They agree. Um, they set a very strict standard um, in Montana. Um, whether or not the, the British Columbia uh, counterpart adopts those um, standards is yet to be seen. Um, and in the meantime, Tech Coal, which is the company that uh, extracts that, and you know, this isn't just coal. This is coking coal, so it's it's like as coal goes, it's as high value as you can get. And I think they ship almost 100% of it to China, so they're making pretty good. They make good money um, doing that. Um, they have committed to looking for a way to reduce, remove selenium. So for those that don't know how, how this selenium works, uh, you, you, if, you, if you go onto Google Earth and you go up into that Elk, that elk River drainage and you, you, you kind of pan out and you see these, you know, they kind of look like gravel pits when, they, when you're far away, but when you get in close, well, essentially it's, it's cropping off the top of a mountain to get to that coal deposit. And when you, the coal isn't all the way to the surface, there's a, there's a, there's a pretty good portion of overburden that gets pushed off to the side. And that's where the selenium is, is in that overburden. So when you, take, when you take the top of it and turn it over and put it upside down, that's, that's what, and any rain on top of it, snow on top of it, that's what liberates that selenium. And, and trying to figure out a way to keep that for either keep that from happening or, or, or figuring out through the drainage system to be able to treat it so it doesn't get into these systems. That's that's what they're going to struggle with. And they, to their credit, they've 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 forked out millions and millions of dollars to try to figure this out. But oh, by the way, they haven't figured it out yet, and they're still talking about, I think, three new, and expanding two, of the existing mines. So it's it's our it's a struggle, and 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 it's it's like at the state department level. That's, that's, that's really what it kind of comes down to. Um, and uh, I would say, if you want to have, have a conversation with your legislators, with our legislators the, at the federal level, um, Senator Tester is, is, has, been a, has been an advocate from the beginning. Um, and I, you know, I think they all care. Um, so it, you know, if, if you're of a mind, that's, that's not a bad plan to do that. That was a kind of a long answer. Hopefully it was, it was one that you were looking for. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I, I've personally met with representatives from tech. They want to engage with the public because um, it makes them look good. It does. So, that, that is a, that is a true statement. The ads, but. <laughs> they like looking good. You're right. Thank you for that one. Um, and Cliff, I see your hands up. Yeah, uh, thanks, Mike. That was really informative. Um, would there be some sort of preparation needed for those wilderness lakes? Like, would they be, they need to be kind of rote known and all that? So, so yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a process. And then that's why what I, what I put on that one, that one slide, we're talking about five to 20. It's not a fast thing. We don't go all of a sudden, like that and we're gonna go do it. So I, I wouldn't, I don't know if I call it a triage or, or more of a, uh, um, well, I identify the lakes. So the first, the first part of it is the survey and inventory. And that's to survey all the lakes and, and the drainages. And we did that, we got the drainages. We, under, we understand where at least we believe that they are, they are native. Um, historic distribution, and you know the none of the lakes that are in the cabinet wilderness had fish in them historically, but most of them have fish in them now, and a lot of those are naturally reproducing, and and all of them are connected down to downstream. So if we're going to have an impact 
on a population, we've got to do it at, you know, you've got to do it at the top. Start at the top and work your way down. So there's a couple of options to do. Um, what is, what's, what's in there right now? Are they, yeah, are those undesirable? Whatever's in well, there? A lot of, a lot of what are in these places are from, especially the, re, the, the natural reproducing are, are legacy fish. Um, there's some Yellowstone cutthroat. There's old, there's rainbows, coastal rainbows. We do, we weren't stocking West Slope cutthroat trout and and uh, red bands into these systems. Um, you know, West Slope cutthroat trout is a 70s kind of a fish. Um, so we were getting them from other places, and you know, it was it's uh, it's you know it's kind of a kind of a manifest destiny kind of thing. We're going to throw everything at it, and by God, the strongest is going to survive, and and then we're going to move forward. So, you know, these, these are the legacies there, but the options we have, certainly poisoning is one of them, but depending on how, the, how big the population is, there's an opportunity potentially, and Matt can, Matt can help with this. Um, it's called swamping. Now, I don't know, that usually is the same species kind of a thing. So if we're, we got rainbows we want to put in and we want to get rid of West Slope cutthroat trout, then I don't know if that's going to work. Um, there's, there's always mechanical removal, but that, that doesn't, that doesn't work very well. So, you know, in, in the, the end game is, yeah, we're probably going to have to be poisoning these lakes and it's quite probable that the public is going to say, well, no, you won't, or, oh, no, you won't here, but you can do it here. Yeah. And that's what this, that's what this education in public process is all about is to, you know, I, I, it's like, it's like my goal to be able to say, you know, we're gonna we're gonna poison out a bunch of West Slope cutthroat trout, and we're gonna replace them with rainbows. And say, how do you like that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I know Matt's been through all that, um, and I wonder if there's a level of kind of concern that's raised because it's a wilderness area, you know, or not. Um, so that'll that'll be interesting. I see Matt's clicked on. Yeah, Matt, Matt can help. The, the beauty is that Matt did it. He set the precedence. No, you're right, Cliff. <clears throat> um, you know, the, the nice thing is those wilderness lakes are some of the highest quality habitat projected to stay cold into the future. Um, the challenges you, you noted and are aware is uh, how you go about doing those management activities with an eye towards preserving the wilderness character. So um, there's, there's precedent for it, but it, there are challenges too. Matt and Mike, if I remember correctly, uh, Jerry Brown, to, or shared with me that he ran into a USGS researcher on one of his cabinet climbs and those three little jewel lakes on the high divide and Libby Creek, I think they're called Libby Lakes, they're all in rock on the divide, were the cleanest water tested in the entire lower 48 in the cabinet. So it's that, qual that quality is that good. And oh, by the way, those are those are fishless lakes, so we won't mess with those. Okay, <laughs> they're pretty high. <laughs> they may have some dead deer in them, but otherwise, yeah, right. <laughs> now, I'm I'm also interested to know: um, Are there concerns with? I mean, you kind of mentioned like hatchery, the hatchery fish are dumb. Are there other concerns with that? Like, if if that's the if that's the mechanism uh, to to repopulate. Um, are there concerns with, with that, um, with their mental capacity? No, no. See, that's why I said I, I, I was, I hesitated. It's, it's not that they're hatchery fish. It's that they, you know, and I, I had that slide about that con convergent evolution. Well, there's a thing about West Slope cutthroat trout. They, they're, they're different than, than a lot of rainbows and that it seems like they see a thing floating in the water and they want to, they want to go after it. And if it's not something to eat, I'll spit it out later, right? And that's that's really that's kind of the same thing with these red bands. They they share they share traits that are that are real similar with West Slope cutthroat trout. Um, so it's 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 a na naivety thing, um, which which is different than these coastal fish. They can be finicky, you know. Those those that have fish worm can attest to it. It's 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 a different it's a different kind of fish and. And I, and I think there's a lot of value in, in saying, well, here's the native, here's a native rainbow trout. And we're going to put it in a, in a valley bottom closed basin lake instead of putting a coastal machine and you've got an opportunity to catch it. 
that's the way to make it. That's that's the plan to make it popular and interesting to the public at, lar at large so that we can go take that next step, which is not as, maybe not as well received and say, okay, we wanna go up into these other lakes that are, that are more, pers that you think about differently and we'd like to do the same thing there. Cause there, there's, a, there's some, there can be real fierce protection of my lake yeah. up in the cabinets or, or the South Fork, wherever it might be. And that's, those are the kind of things that we have to kind of get around. Thanks. Yeah, and to, and to follow up on that, I mean, does that, what do folks, what are your first reactions when you kind of hear that, that pitch, I guess, is that uh, what resonates there? Or does that kind of cause any, any uh, heartburn from anybody? I mean, this is a, a place where we want you to be totally honest with us on that because it is going to be a, just like the South Fork project was. I mean, we, that education is, is important because we need that public buy-in. So I can start that. Go ahead, Mark. I just had a question and also I suppose a comment. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm supportive of the idea of putting these red bands in places like the cabinets. I think it's a beautiful fish and it's a special fish to me as well. Are there other restoration projects with any other agencies and anywhere else where these were, were historically native that have shown success or that, that you could use to model or is it something going on elsewhere? Oh, oh, oh yeah, we got the South Fork. I just mean with the red band itself. Is there a red um, band? It's, it's, you anywhere? know what? Um, there, there, there might likely be some in other states. I mean, the distribution is into Washington, Idaho, um, down into into Oregon and, and into Northern California, and and there are there are places where they're in much more even more dire straits than than what they are up here, and they've done they've done those kinds of things. I think our our example is more is more the West Slope cutthroat trout. You know, the the hardest thing for me that's going to be for us is going to be. Somebody's going to stand up and say, so let me get this straight. You're going to go on a lake and you're going to kill a bunch of perfectly, perfectly good rainbow trout. And then you're going to put rainbow trout back in. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we're going to do. So it's going to be, it's going to be up to us to, to kind of, exp to do a really good job of explaining what, you know, the, the uniqueness of it. And then that's what I, you know, that's why we were hoping that, that we can get him into these lakes and a guy could say, yeah, I went to, I went to this lake, um, Mount Henry Lake up in the Yak. That's, that's red band trout. If you ever want to walk up into a, into a not so difficult hike in a mountain lake and catch a fish, you say, oh, there, there you go. There they are. Um, I don't know if that answered your question, Mark, but uh, yeah, that, as far as, as far as red bands go, it's, it's such a new thing, even though we've been doing it since I was in Libby, I, I, I was there in 92 and we've been, we've been working this angle since since then molly go ahead i think your hand was up and then we'll go to ipad My yeah. one. i just quickly was thinking you know with i'm sure you're familiar with the 2019 film that patagonia put out artificial like the i i run in circles where the general sentiment you know being an oregonian and a salmon fisherman and a fly fisherman and also a bait fisherman and all of those things but like the general circles that i run in we we've grown up in this generation where hatcheries are now considered to be evil like carte blanche right so i and and as somebody that comes from an epidemiological background doing biocomputing with genetics like i'm totally on board and i hear everything you're saying and i'm like great but i i want to know like what your elevator pitch is going to be to the public because like wh what is, you know, I, I feel like there is, uh, or maybe that's the question you're asking us. Like there's, there's this defense mechanism that you're gonna run into with public that's, um, are you like, are you saying that's very different and there's a lesser of the evils? Like, I'm just, I wanna hear that in a plain language perspective, I guess. Yeah, sure. thinking of that, Molly. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, no, great, great point. And I'm familiar with that documentary. It's it's well done. Um, the the main focus there is on those those big production facilities, salmon, steelhead, 
And yeah, no, no doubt there, there are issues. I mean, some of them, they're even raising them in big net pens out in the ocean. Um, what Mike was talking about in terms of us using hatcheries as a, as a restoration tool, um, you know, there are ways around that where the fish can spend a very short amount of time in, in the hatchery, the artificial environment, before it goes back out in the wild. So there are some shortcuts you can do to minimize some of those negative effects. Um, and Jim and others, if, if there, I'll throw this out there, if there's interest and we get to a point where we can do field trips, I would love to take people up to Sokokini Springs Conservation Hatchery. That, that um, was on my mind too, Matt. Yeah. Sokokini, that, that would, especially for Molly and her genetics background and others. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, it's, it's, it's a broad and, and deep issue. <laughs> No. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Molly, your point's really good, though, is that how do we, in very plain language, try to make that sales pitch to folks so that they it, it, it connects with them? Because documentaries like the one you, you referenced, they do a great job of that. But then it almost builds up something now we have to overcome in this type of a scenario. So it's, it's, a, it's a really good point, though, for us to workshop through this. Madeline, you had your hand up for a while. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I wanted to know, um, I hear about lakes in the cabinets, I hear about Henry Lake in the Yak. I was wondering, uh, the lakes in the Ten Lake Scenic Area, are they um, historically known for having red bands? And if yes, um, would there be consideration to um, replenish them there too? Yeah, Madeline, um, so the, the Ten Lakes Area, um, you need to go remember back to that to that map that I had. There was, for whatever reason, red bands didn't didn't really um, expand beyond what what is right now Libby Dam. So so they didn't get up into that area. That's that's a West Slope cutthroat trout area. And you know, and, and I'll I'll start it. Matt can probably add on to it. That kind of an oh by the way, um, there is there is a lake that we're gonna we're gonna be working at uh, this fall. Um, up in the Ten Lakes, it's Rainbow Lake, that has a has a wild reproducing population of Yellowstone cutthroat trout, which really so their their historic distribution is nowhere near Northwest Montana. Right, um, but it's but it's a but they, they grow some absolutely beautiful fish. Um, yeah, they, your maps went a bit quick for me, so um, that's why we get now a question um, that is uh, was answered earlier in your presentation, which was very enlightening for the rest. And uh, yeah, I, I would be one of those people who say, so, okay, you're going to kill all the rainbows <laughs> after in order to get the red bands going again. So that, that indeed I see as an issue with the public probably, but um, brainstorming with a lot of... Um, very smart fishermen that you have there in the room with you. Um, I'm sure that there will be an, a way that that can be circumvented um, partially. Yeah, you know, a big part of we is is we're going to have to search for advocates. You know, there 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 are other folks that, you know, if somebody just doesn't trust fish, wildlife, and parks, um, um, uh, other folks that are like like us like CAC. That uh, if we can convince you guys that uh, you're you're the folks that that that'll be helpful in going out and, and explaining maybe in better language than I could um, what we're trying to do and I and I would say call call text email anytime if there's a question you have that that I was that I might have been too te technical on um, that you might somebody might have a question for you that you want to relay it back to them. I think you are super diplomatic, actually. Raise your explanation of that. Living in the Eureka area, it's of course a very hot uh, topic. Uh, one of the things that um, has to be um, known, I think everybody there probably does know, is the selenium is a natural occurring um, thing in our streams and rivers in low amounts. So it's there, there for sure already. It's just the uh, elevated levels that are concerning. but. The, you did a great job. I'm glad I didn't have to do it because I would have been a lot more vocal about it. By, but I understand your position. Uh, position so thanks. <laughs> well, you'd be as vocal as you want to be. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the duties of the CACs. You get to be that's, very vocal. That's, that's the job. <laughs>
<laughs> Dylan, yeah, okay. I, see, I see Cody made it on. Um, it'd be Cody, it'd be interesting to get your perspective as a professional outfitter. I would imagine there's a market and a desire should these native rainbows take hold in the lakes that that's a, people come from all over to add that to their list. I see that happen in Wyoming with some of the native species. So Cody, I don't know if you, if your connection's good, but I was curious as to your thoughts there. Yeah. Yep, Since Cody is not saying anything, I, I, I will throw in that I really support this idea. So, um, you know, I will read up more uh, on it to get yet better informed, but uh, I think it's a great idea and I fully support it. Thank you, Madeline. Yeah, and, and we'll, we'll make, obviously this will be, this is going to be an ongoing discussion, but all, all your input and insights are, are much appreciated. Um, yeah, we're, we're, not, we're not at the end, we're at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. I think with the South Fork Project, Matt, it only took, what, seven, eight years? Of preparation. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Ten years of implementation. Right. Corey, you've had your hand up for a while. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I guess kind of going back to the South Fork project, you know, I, I was, I am a big supporter of that. Maybe I'm kind of a romantic. So I like to think if I could go back 150 years, you know, what would it, what would it be like in places? So I think maybe the opportunity for education could go back to that and, um, really highlight um the success and you know i don't want to say advertise the places in which you did that work but i mean it that was all pretty transparent too you know margaret lake all those places like that where different methodologies swamping or or wrote known and po you know poisoning effectively handkerchief lake it's really accessible um <clears throat> just highlight the success of that and maybe in layman's terms like hey you can go to handkerchief lake now and you you can now catch a 12 inch cutthroat. I don't know the specifics of that, but that it's a value system, you know? And so people need to um, have something tangible almost, you know, like, yeah, that there were in impacts to the fishermen. Um, but now you, there is this, you know, and uh, it might be an opportunity to highlight the success of that project. That's, I guess that's my thought. And I'm of course, supportive of, you know, those native fish and efforts to conserve and, and, you know, just, just for those future, you know, things change so fast and there's lots of places a guy can go catch perch, you know, and so very few places you might be able to catch a red band or, so thank you. Yeah, yeah that is, that is an excellent point, Corey. And, and one of the things that, you know, would, would be nice, and this is, these are the things that we need to figure out is, is we're not going to do 10 lakes at a time is to find a lake and you know and, and angie would know would know this one it's one of the ones we talked about was howard lake where you can drive it's a mountain lake that you can drive to and if you know if we can if we can be successful a very very heavily recreated lake and if that's a place where we can be successful then you, then you can move on to the, to the other things that's that's kind of, I think that's what was helpful in the South Fork. And, you know, they say, okay, it wasn't that bad. And then, okay, this, this sounds good. And you're right. That's, that's, that's hopefully the direction we're going to move. Yeah, it was really well said, Corey. Thank you for that one. Um, Eric set his hand up and then Angie, I think, had her hand up. Yeah, hi. Um, I think it's a cool project. I always appreciate these kind of things. I think they're exciting and, um, I very superficially, I sort of understand why people have concerns about it and my lake and all that stuff. But I, I think it's a very superficial argument and um, yeah, he's very, you know, it's never a entire system, entire County, entire state sort of thing. It's these very isolated deals and it's, it shouldn't be a hard sell. I, I don't understand why it always is, but um, cool project. Um, and I, and to the point of the hatchery thing i mean there's been all sorts of imperiled species that we've had that have been augmented by you know whether it's captive breeding programs or whatever whether you're talking about ferrets or all sorts of stuff there's been good success augmenting wild populations with basically captive raised stuff without 
negative impacts. Um, I'm, I might have missed some of the discussion while I was trying to get home, but um, are red bands, are, there, are they listed or considered to be listed or is there any consideration or is that a selling point in this argument that if you have more places with populations of red bands that would keep them from going down that road? And uh, um, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, Eric, uh, that's a really good question. Um, back in the early 2000s, they were, they were actually petitioned to be listed as threatened. Um, and the Fish and Wildlife Service, I'm, I couldn't tell you exactly what the phraseology is, but um, not warranted at that time. And, I, and the reason for that is that, you know, they may be, you could maybe make an argument for that if you were talking about a Kootenai drainage red band, but in their, in their entire distribution, that they couldn't make a strong argument to, to do that. Now, as I recall, I could be wrong, and Jim, maybe you can help me with this. I believe that they are listed as a species of species of special concern in Montana. Just just like West Slope Cutthroat. I mean, there's there's point being is that there's recognition that, that it is, you know, it is important and it is it is in a position where it, it's in need of we call it like in need of management. Um, it, yeah, there's been a number of things, you know, it, I think about Eastern Montana and sage grouse and ranchers attitudes towards them before they were considered to be listed. And all now you talk to guys, or, you know, in the last how many years, like, yep, we don't want anything to possibly even come to that. Like we'll comply. Like we're happy to help. <laughs> like, yeah. Like we're, we're supportive of sage grouse now. Just don't let it go down that road. And I, I would not never go out of the gate with that argument, but like, I think it's a, it's a good, it's a good thing to consider talking to people. Like, like there's a good reason for us to have a stable population, to have a place where there's some kind of, you know, like th there's good wild fish here. If we ever need them, you know, they're upstream, like, we have these kind of core places where we have them now. And uh, just so that we, if it ever got to that point, it's not gonna go to that point sort of thing. Yeah, that's a really, that's another really good point. And, and Dylan, thank you for recording this because I'm not writing any of it down. <laughs> yeah, no, this is really, really good discussion and topics and, or ideas that you're all bringing up. So thank you, Eric. Um, Angie, I think you had a, 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 your hand up and then Lee has his hand up and then we'll maybe move on to round table if there's no other comments, but go ahead, Angie. Sure. Hi, Mike. Just a, a couple of questions just to try to understand a little bit. On your slides where you had down is that lakes that currently have them, once had them, that you were looking for them? Okay. I, I, so you blinked out on me there for a second. Oh, but I, I didn't, sorry. I didn't hear all of it. Yeah, the strain evaluation lakes that you had on your slide. Uh, what is that? Is that lakes that used to have them or that you were looking to see if there was any existing in those current lakes? Yeah, it was kind of a, kind of a combination of that. The, uh, the Kilbrennan example is uh, um, there, there's, there's no scientific information about there being red bands there, but that, that part of the drainage, the Yak drainage, the Kilbrennan Creek, um, we know was historic distribution of red bands. And then there's this newspaper article from 1910 or something around that time where they, they talked about catching, I think they call it a black spotted trout in Kilbrennan Lake. And, and so we're, we're pretty confident that Kilbrennan wasn't, you know, later it became, it actually became a, a brood lake for rainbow trout. Um, but at the time, it wasn't. It, it hadn't. It, it hadn't been stocked by anything. So there was a. That was a possibility. So there was an open, an open basin, meaning it has connection to lower in the drainage. That we were we were okay with red bands being there because they're in the they're in the drainage. The other two lakes are closed basin lakes, so no chance of them getting in or out. That was purely about 
if we put them into this lake and let people catch them and then do you know uh, anecdotal creel and and ask the locals how was it um just to see that is this it's a kind of fish like i said the point a, a large point is is uh is getting acceptance and part of getting acceptance especially with fish is getting anglers to accept doing putting taking a perfectly good rainbow and replacing it with another rainbow that's that was the whole idea behind that and you know the kill brennan example was just absolutely beautiful until it it fell apart the, it was you know we we poisoned that because of yellow perch um mm. and and uh and put these had had access to to those red bands out of Murray Spring. Put them in there, and you saw that picture of the of the of the young man that had you know, just a dandy. Unfortunately, uh, in the interim years, um, the brook trout got back in. Um, we there's a uh, black bullheads in there, and then the most recent thing is largemouth bass uh, were illegally put into the lake, and and that's just kind of. It just kind of tips it over for these red bands. You know, there, there's, there's a very rare one caught anymore. Um, so that's what I was talking about. Well, how are they in competition? But that was that was a really that was a shining example for for several years of, of see these things are pretty good. Think about letting us go into these other areas and getting them into there too. You know, you'll you'll still get an opportunity to fish for these things and. And we'll and we'll get them into their historic distribution. We got two birds with one stone. Gotcha. So also out of curiosity, when you go in and, and poison a lake or clean it for reintroduction, what is the, the time frame are you looking at? I mean, if you poison a lake, is there so many seasons you have to wait before you can reintroduce for the or do you do it? I guess I'm just I'm I wonder how it actually works. Yeah, and, and Matt, Matt would be a lot better. At the technical part of this, but typically in a lake, it's a one-time deal, and, and you, you want to do it before there's ice on the lake. Um, you want to do it when you know, but you don't want to do it when the, when there's a, a large number of people that might want to fish the lake where you have to sign it and say, okay, no fishing here. The whole process generally takes a day um, for the lake, but then, like in the Kilbrennan example, downstream in Kilbrennan Creek we had a what we had to detoxify it so there's a there's a chemical potassium permanganate that uh, makes this rote known inert so that we don't affect fish down the way and that that can it depends on you know i'm going to get myself in trouble i don't know if matt's still on um it depends on how much you put in the lake um how much of it is because it gets taken up not just by fish, but it gets uh, um, it, it it gets metabolized just by by the things in the in the water too. It breaks down it, on mm -hmm. its own. The the uh, the potassium permanganate is just a thing to help help the process go faster. So it, depending on water temperature, which is a big deal, it, you know, it can take a couple of days to a couple of weeks for the whole process to go, and then. Typically what we do is we, the next year, the next spring is when we put fish in. Oh, okay. So do you and, just have a massive float up of all the dead fish? <laughs> seem... Well, you know, you know, some, some of them float to the shoreline, the vast majority of them just sink to the bottom. Okay. So it depends on the lake, depends on the day. Um, most of these lakes, it's, you know, if there's a lake with a bunch of people around it, Anybody from Eureka remembers Carpenter Lake? That was a bigger deal um, because people saw dead fish. Most of the times, they don't they don't see much. And and we have folks that'll walk around the lakes and and clean them up, clean some of the most <laughs> more obvious stuff up. And, and oh, by the way, it's it's not toxic to to creatures that eat them. So an eagle shows up, a, a bear, a coyote, and eats a fish, which they do. Um, that's, that's not an issue for those animals. So there's okay. some local cleanup too. Yeah. Say so public, I'm sure wouldn't enjoy seeing that afterwards. And I just thought yeah. it wouldn't help and, the, the and cause. Absolutely, and absolutely. That's a, that's an education thing to, to remind mm -hmm. folks, you know, it is, and it is killing, 
and and you're going to see some fish but we'll do our best to keep that at a minimum okay thank you thanks angie so i think uh cliff has his hand up so we'll go to lee and then cliff and then i think we will move on to the round table if that's all right lee go ahead yeah, just real quick. One thing I also remember from the South Fork project is when those fish do die like that and sit in the in the lake and decompose, it does provide a little bit of a nutrient uh, uh, blast, if you will, for when the next batch of fish comes in to you know provide nutrients for all the other things that they eat to grow. But real quick, uh, you know, one thing I remember on the South Fork project was you were replacing like rainbows, you know, with a West Slope cutthroat. And, some anglers thought it was a less desirable fish as far as a sport fish. With this, is it since it's rainbow to rainbow, do you think that'll make things a little bit easier? There isn't as big a difference between the two, or is there are these less hardy compared to what's in there type thing? You know, it's 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 hard to say. Because the you know the the argument is that well you 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 got a perfectly good rainbow and then you're gonna put another rainbow in. Um, so it's it's gonna be up to us to explain. And it isn't easy because that's, you know, that's you, you got to be careful how deeply in the science you get. You know, there is a difference between the two and, and there is one that actually is native. Um, but I, I like I said, I think I think if we went into a lake and say we're going to poison out West Slope cutthroat trout and we're going to put rainbows back in. What do you think? Uh, and there is a lake that 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 is a that it's on that list that that might be a possibility and that's. That's uh, Granite Lake up uh, that has West Slope cutthroat trout in, in the lake and just downstream of it are red bands. So that'll be an interesting thing. Um, but it's, you know, it, it, it's going to come down to, we're going to find out when we find out. Um, and we'll have, we'll have those professionals like, like Matt and, and, uh, and, his, and his crew and the guys that are in Libby to help explain that and, and and hopefully you know we'll be able to make that argument um, or justification to the folks like you and you can help with that too I awesome hope, hope. <laughs> cliff go ahead with last questions or comments yeah sorry to drag it out um, oh, that's all right I'm always impressed with FWP's kind of balance of managing the resource for the resource sake and managing the resource for the hunter or the angler or the sportsman's sake. Um, where do you put this particular initiative? Is this for the is this for the sportsman or is this for the species? And then the next question is uh, really like, where's the money come from? To I mean, are there pots of money that are easy to grab? For this kind of effort, or is that something you got to go get grants for, and all that kind of thing? So, so the answer to your first question is yes. It is it is for conservation, but I think we, I think that we can make a pretty good argument that 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 in the examples that 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 we've had in the past, that uh, this can provide a pretty darn good recreational fishery too. Um, now I've forgotten what the second question was. Where are you getting that money? Oh well. I don't see Matt on here anymore. Matt had to so, run, unfortunately. He probably knew the money question was coming. Yeah, Matt, Matt conveniently Fork, left. <laughs> so the South, the way that the South Fork was set up was mitigation for the operation of Hungry Horse Dam. The same situation exists in the Kootenai. It, there's a mitigation program for the for the building and operation of Libby Dam. And there are there are operational mitigations, there's on-site mitigation, and there's off-site mitigation. And uh, and uh, we have not had that much difficulty justifying uh, um, the offsite mitigation so far. We we expect that it'll go it'll go the same way as the South Fork. Awesome, good good questions there, Kiff. Though to kind of wrap this this segment up, so no bull trout, not a bull trout question. That's well, okay. we'll save that for next time. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Mike. That was really good, really interesting. And, and thank you, CAC members, for the really good uh, comments and questions. So uh, definitely just the beginning of this process. So um, if other things come to your mind, please reach out to, to Mike or any of us to, to share them because it's going to be a big, I think, a big, pretty big deal. So 
Um, let's just finish up our meeting with just roundtable and um, don't feel obligated to share anything if you don't have anything, but this is just your chance to um, share what's on your mind as CAC members with any of us on any variety of topics that you want us to be aware of or other CAC members to be aware of. So I'll just kind of go down the list and if you could, you know, we got an hour for, we got 50 minutes. So um, we'll make sure and give everybody an opportunity to share what's on their mind. So Shelly, I'll start with you because you're at the top of my list. Okay. Um, I do want to ask about mountain lion uh, that hit the, because, you know, there's varying topics about what happened that they got, it was a collared mountain lion from Yellowstone that got treed by hounds. And was it investigated properly with Gianforte killing it? Some say that he had hired a crew to tree it and he came in later was a mountain lion in there in the tree for a long time and was it properly investigated on both sides because uh, you know I mean with him killing the wolf um, it throws into question credibility so just want to know if it's been properly investigated so it took witnesses from uh, the other side of the topic. Yeah let's see Ron or Jim do you? I just I just start off with um, I think it's kind of a that is a non-story, honestly. I've worked on Mount Lyons, Shelley, my entire career. I even wrote a book on him. I mean, I, I can't hide from the issue until I retire. I'll, I'll get drugged back in. And uh, bi biology, resource-wise, uh, Montana has some of the most robust populations of lions in the nation. Uh, about two to four resident um, adults per 100 square kilometers. You add in the transients that can jump up to six. We've been monitoring. Neil's got a program up here where we've done some bio bullets and monitoring for densities. We're good. So it's not a population issue at all. It was a legal hunt, as I understand it, um, Shelly, and it used hounds. It's kind of a more of, an, of a personal value on do you believe an elk or a deer or lion should be hunted or a wolf? It's kind of a personal thing as it, it's kind of a non-story from a resource or um, you can hunt lions during a legal season here. It just happens to be the governor and he's super high profile. So this this one's a kind of a non-story in my mind. Ron, if you have anything or Lee on the actual, if there's a investigation, I have no idea, but it's from a lion conservation, it's a non-story. My, my question was, I'm, I know that, you know, mountain lion season is here. It was more of, was it done legally? Uh, okay. There was two sides of the story as to whether he did this properly or not. Okay, yeah, I have, no, I have no idea there. Ron, Lee? Yeah, I might just say, Jim, um, to answer your question, Shelly, yes, it was done legally. You know, Jim, I think, points out well that it, it's just a matter of how you feel about, you know, should you use hounds, should you not use hounds, that type of thing. But I can tell you the hunt was done legally. Great, thanks, Ron and Jim. Yeah, any other you know questions, Shelly, or topics on your mind? Nope. Springs around the corner, which is great. Right. Yes, it is great. Um, great. Well, thank you. Uh, Angie, I see you next on my list. Sorry, trying to unmute myself here. Um, I, I don't know, is my, yeah, Mike's still on here. I was just going back to thinking about the pictures he had of the Libby fisheries. Is that is something that's going to be reopened up um, or is the fisheries for the red band going to stay? I, I think he said it was up in Eureka where they were actually moved to, is that correct? Well, actually they're nowhere now. That was, oh. it, was an ex, it was an experiment and- Oh, it was just a and, test. And we moved okay. on, but, yeah, we've had we've we've actually had discussion about can we can we reestablish the Libby hatchery and it and it it's it it turns out probably not. Um, there's a lot of there were a lot of sp springs that used to exist in the 30s up and up until the 70s that are, are not there anymore. Yeah, um, it's kind of different down in there. So yeah, we it's it's a lot drier, mm -hmm. but what we can do, like Matt mentioned. So when we, when we look at conservation, we're not looking necessarily to create a, 
a big take a whole hatchery up to make a brew it'd be nice but what we can do is we can take we can take fish out of the wild we can get just enough of through eggs to be able to grow them to a size to stock them out and and there's a possibility you may remember the, the Libby Hatcher when there where I showed those two raceways there used to be four and we yep. buried two of them because they were falling apart but we could probably get that far but but it, it it'll never be a production hatchery we'll have to go somewhere else for that and one of the options is potentially uh, isolation facility that's that's uh, part of the Creston hatchery here in Kalispell oh okay thanks I don't they have a lot to add right now Dylan sorry no worries. Yeah, no, all good. Thank you for the good questions and comments. Uh, let's see, Cliff, I see you next on my list. Well, I feel like I've said a lot tonight. I apologize for dominating the mic, um, but I am interested to know. Uh, well, first of all, I'm very excited about uh, the state park at the North Shore. I think that's an incredible um, addition to our community and recreational assets. Um, same thing with the Bad Rock. Uh, you know, conservation property, and uh, really excited about the the new um, archery kind of opportunities. I'm interested to know a little bit about that process. Like, how, like, does an archery trail need to be? And and I don't know if anybody here, Dave's not here, but uh, you know, like, that's that seems like a very uh, user specific kind of um, amenity. And I'm wondering if those trails really are like. Um, yeah, do they do they work for other user groups or it's it's just it's just archery folks and just like a particular time of year uh, that they use it while they're practicing prior to like hunting season or if that that gets used in any other way, which is kind of like a very specific question. But um, otherwise, I'm super excited about the advancements. Yeah, thanks, Cliff. Dave is definitely the right person to answer that, but I can take a swing at it because we're going to really rely on those archery ranges for our education programs because we've we've got the most growth in what's called the national archery in the schools program up here in northwest montana and it's a really cool program that we basically facilitate for schools that want to basically add to their gym class a learn how to archery shoot and it's you can you can guess that uh, PE teachers love it because it basically we help provide them all the gear and it's these cool genesis bows and the safety backstop and the targets. And we give them a curriculum, we train their PE teacher. Um, and then they basically, however many times during the week or month, they do archery, learn how to shoot archery with their students. And then the kids love it. And then now uh, what these archery ranges will do is provide a, another place to hold tournaments, to now have your class leave the school and go on a field trip to the archery range. So uh, we've almost doubled the number of schools that are involved in the archery and the NASP program up here. We, I think we have almost 30, which is really cool. And, and just trying to keep growing that. To answer your question directly, yes, the, the archery ranges are very site specific and user specific. So like at Lone Pine, for example, if you're familiar with it, it's, you know, that archery range is, you know, very clearly marked and signed and set aside for archery users so that we don't have runners or, or horse users going through there as people are shooting their bows. And so, yes, that the, the range will stay very dedicated to archery. The uh, big arm development is across the highway from the state park. So it's, it's a piece of land that we picked up with that easement. And so uh, that range is going to be its own kind of unique little area on the other side, completely separate from the campground. And it will be specifically for archery use. Gotcha. Thanks. Hopefully Hedges Elementary School is uh, on the list. <laughs> I don't know if they are, but let's, let's get them in it, man. Let's, let's go. Let's happen, talk to, uh, they're in, they love our aquatic ed program that we got them down. They were just fish ice fishing a couple weeks ago. So that's right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks Cliff. Uh, Corey, go ahead. Yeah. Thanks. Hey, I just wanted to, <clears throat> I guess, commend everybody um, at fish, wildlife and parks and the commission, you know, I, the season setting uh, process was really interesting and uh to me and i guess i appreciated the fact that i was able to you know be engaged at, at whatever level i as a member of the public was comfortable with and and also was you know most of the stuff was available for me to weigh in on i thought that was uh, a really interesting process i didn't necessarily get everything i wanted you know as a individual but i thought the 
the process was, I think that's important to recognize that we, it, it seemed like a negotiation to me, you know, and there's some things I, I personally wasn't happy with. Um, I felt like sometimes Fish, Wildlife and Parks employees got beat up a little bit, even by the, the commission, you know, and, and uh, I understand that you, your guys' roles, it's a sacrifice a lot of times. And, um, you know, you advise probably more than anything. And um, I just wanted to let that be known that I appreciate that. Um, it was really eye-opening for me. So I, I'm hoping that the commission sticks with their commitment to reevaluate the decisions that were made in, in you know, in two years from now, I guess, if, if that's the time frame. Um, with the things, you know, watching the public comment at that last day was pretty, pretty intriguing. You know, I guess I'm thankful we have a, we're in a democratic environment because I think that's a, a good example of it. So, um, no, I just really I appreciate you guys doing this stuff. And I, I think it's really important for us currently and into the future. Um, what else? Oh, I'll put a shameless plug in. I'm a, I'm a part of the family forestry expo uh, coming up in the, in May. So if there's any kind of nonprofits that would be interested in uh, having an exhibit there for their, um, again, it's, it's focused on ecosystems, the forest environment, watersheds, you know, those kind of things. So I know the Fish, Wildlife and Parks is involved. Um, anybody has interest in uh, exhibiting anything, um, give me a call, look me up. I, I can be found at the Forest Service. Um, so that's, that's about it. But I, again, thanks, appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, thank you, Corey. And yeah, any feedback from all of you who participated in that whole season setting process would be really valuable for us on what worked, what did you think didn't work, because it was kind of a new process this year. And, and so um, love to get feedback on ways moving forward that we can make sure that we have clear, we set clear expectations or, or, or meet all your needs there. So thank you, Corey. Eric, I got you next. No, hi, thank you. Um, uh number of, well back to the archery range thing um is some of that funding pr dollars is that towards ranges that's one of the i think that bears mentioning that i think there's pr dollars that fund shooting ranges and archery specific ranges is one of those and so it wasn't like you guys decided not to build 10 miles of trail somewhere else in lieu of building an archery range but that was i think pr dollars right totally right yeah thank you eric yeah. We, yeah um yeah and i'll just um uh also th throw out there i really enjoyed our family watched a lot of the commission meeting on january 28th and that whole season setting thing and it was really interesting and educational and um if i was technically savvy enough to figure out how to comment online or by phone i would have probably done that um the one thing I'll mention because it pertains to region one, the, there was a church slew petition about making it no wake. And I was a little disappointed in kind of how that whole thing went down or was portrayed. But um, I think as that topic comes up in the future, um, I mean, I would be in support of having church slew be no wake. And I think if for a good part of the year it is, you can't, it's not connected to the river in a boatable sense. And if that was a, a lake somewhere by itself, um, people wouldn't be okay with 35 foot wake boats, you know, ripping wake borders around in there um, if it was by itself. But the fact that they can get in there in the summer and, you know, nearly take out paddle borders and everybody else is kind of ridiculous. So um, it's something that should be talked about and I hope people are reasonable on that. Um, uh, but it was, yeah, I'd encourage anybody to watch those commission meetings. That was my first time really sitting down and watching the whole one. And it was a great discussion and yeah, appreciate the work you guys do. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. So stay tuned for more on the church slew, uh, yeah. situation. The commission, uh, tasked us with, tasked us with creating a work group. Work. <laughs> and so we're working on that right now and, and we'll be sending out here soon, uh, an announcement seeking applications for anyone who wants to serve on that work group and try to come up with a recommendation to take to the commission on, on the no wake discussion. So 
stay yeah. tuned and, and that'll be a topic I'm sure we'll bring to the CAC all of you to present and kind of similarly just get your feedback yeah. on. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Thanks, Eric. Okay, who do I see next? Um, Mark. Thanks, Dylan. Uh, I suppose I would like to echo Cliff Kipp's words and say that I'm extremely excited about all of the developments in our in our parks in the area, and I'm super excited to see how the Summers Beach develops and turns out. Um, I guess Mike Hensler got me a little curious when he was surprised that no one had any questions regarding bull trout and maybe just a little curious as to what, what you may have anticipated in that area. No, really, that was a Van Iburn thing. Um, and I think it goes back to the, him remembering what it was, what he was doing when he was with the forest service. Okay. But there it's, it's no, there's, there's interesting things going on with bull trout, some good, some not so good. And, and, and it would have been, we were thinking about putting it on tonight, but it would have, yeah, it would have lasted a long time. I see. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> and excuse my ignorance for not knowing the answer to this question, but does FWP manage or have any uh, rifle shooting ranges that are open to the public or, or in re, it, I'm just thinking in relation to these archery ranges, is that something that may be coming down the pipeline in the future or do they already exist? No, but that's a dream of ours, Mark, is, uh, you know, as, as most of you in the Flathead Valley know, it can be kind of hard to get a, a good, get to an archery range. The ones that are clubs, have, I've heard some of them have waiting lists now, and then which leads you to just have to go out on public lands and shoot, which is fine, except for we have a lot of folks who don't clean up their, their shooting messes. And so it creates, you know, issues with that littering. It also just creates the challenge of going and finding a safe place to shoot. So we, we put out a call about a year or two ago to all of our large landowners, meaning the corporate timber landowners, the forest service, the DNRC, basically making a, a plea to them. If you have a 10 to 20 acre slice of land, somewhat close to the Flathead Valley that you'd be willing to sell. Um, we, Cause we do the PR money, like Eric mentioned is, is uh, there's a nice big uh, pot of gold there that's up for grabs for projects like that. And that is a, a huge need that we see. It's also a huge challenge to find a 10 to 20 acre piece of land that um, doesn't cost 20 million bucks or is not you know, surrounded by homes increasingly. So it's a huge, huge need. So thank you for bringing that topic up. And if anybody has 20 to 10 to 20 acres or knows somebody with 10 to 20 acres that they'd wanna, we could put a beautiful uh, shooting range on it. Yeah, give me a checkbook. I'll start shopping for you. <laughs> Eric yeah. has a stand up. Maybe he has land. Yeah, Eric. <laughs> Let's just make this deal happen. No, I uh, I actually talked to Dave the other day about this because I knew that there was range dollars available. Um, there's been a bunch of people and Big Fork and Whitefish and um, in the Nordic skiing community that were love to uh, create a biathlon range somewhere um, in adjacent to uh, um, some Nordic trails. Um, there's a lot of interest in um, that sport and uh, for a number of years, and that's kind of been rekindled by the Olympics in some people's minds. And so um, there's definitely people in uh, the flooded Valley that are talking to people and trying to get something going. So um, hopefully, They'll be talking to FWP with some proposals here coming up. You can see it's on my dream list up there on the board. Number two, flathead shooting range. So please let's make this dream a reality because it's, it's our window might be shrinking faster than we can catch it before. There's no real land available. That's not an hour to drive. So, yeah. So Dylan, it's too bad that Don Clark's not here to promote it because he did originally, there is a really nice, long distance shooting range um, just south of Libby. Um, it's, it's, it was funded by, by uh, um, public dollars. It, it, it requires, uh, it's got a gate where you have to have a, 
a key number. Um, but uh, if you're interested, I can get you the contact. His name is Mike Syrian. Um, so if you want to, you want to shoot 500 yards at a at a metal dinghy thing, you you can do it. It's a it's a really nice place. So in the meantime. All right. Well, yeah. Thanks, Mark. Any other thoughts? Uh, not on the not that I can think of immediately. So thanks for your time. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, where Molly? It's really hard to go later in the group because, <laughs> like, the ideas snowball exponentially. Um, so yeah, everything everyone else said, um, and. I just wanna make sure that we are not losing sight of the conversation brought up in previous meetings about access to our BMAs. And I know that there were a lot of issues this year and um, I even had a conversation today for an hour with a community member right before this meeting um, about high concern over the Stoltz access. And I've talked to quite a few people who, like myself, access that area with a side-by-side -side and would be a very strong supporter of eliminating motorized access. And I hunt over there like multiple days a week uh, accessing with our side-by-side, -side, but we just see that it is not being treated properly. Um, and so I'd, I'd just like to know if those conversations are still happening. I know Captain Anderson and I think several of you all had to have several meetings regarding the BMAs this year um, and some abuse that's going on. And another thing I'd like to throw out there from a volunteer boots on the ground perspective is particularly with um, you know, the Haskell area, the signage is not consistent um, with the rules that are published online or the different access points. So if that's something where we could encourage Stoltz to even print new material, um, I can get an army of people together to take down old signs and put up new signs um, just to create consistent messaging. Um, but it's something that keeps coming up in community circles, even well after the hunting season. So I just want to throw that out there. Um, and then two more things quickly. The CRMP is coming back to life. So I'd like to see topics related to the CRMP maybe brought up if it seems at all relevant for the CAC to have discussions about river management in general, as that comes back to life with funding um picking up from where we were in 2019 it seems really overdue um and then as everyone's talked about this incredible opportunities with our new parks and access um i also don't i feel like i'm being really negative like i'm echoing all the positive things that everyone said prior and i agree with all that uh but also the blankenship issue coming up on this season and i know a lot of that is out of the jurisdiction of fwp but um if I'm jogging my memory correctly, there is some overlap. I could be totally wrong. Maybe it's just county and federal, um, but is there anything that can be done from a state perspective, if even in terms of, of messaging, like what can we do boots on the ground? Okay, I'll stop talking. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks Molly. And I, so I think I owe you a thanks because tomorrow actually at 11 a.m. me and our new region one access coordinator, Macy, are meeting with Veronica Corbett with Backcountry Hunters and Anglers because- Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, so you know thank you. Okay. Timely, timely point. So yeah, tomorrow at 11, we're meeting with Veronica, who's apparently like the, I don't know what she does exactly with Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. Staffer. Um, so you know Kevin, and um, we all banded together and we were like, Kevin needs some support. So we were able to throw a lot of our funding at getting an, an additional assistant for Kevin. Um, and we're only able to do that as a state chapter because of our license plates, which you probably see everywhere now. So yeah, great revenue stream. Yeah. Awesome. Well, she, Veronica reached out and I, so she said you or someone locally had said, we're interested in working with them to help us with our working with our corporate timberland owners to do these volunteer cleanup projects or just explore ideas to really 
uh, promote relationships with our large landowners here. And so she and May Macy and I and are going to brainstorm tomorrow. So and hopefully bring some of these concepts into reality. So thanks for getting that ball rolling. And Macy, we'll have her uh, join us one of these meetings. Uh, she's our new Region 1 Access Coordinator working under and kind of in Dave's team. Um, and so she's going to be a great asset to do exactly what you said, Molly, because everybody really increasingly sees that need to just really band together strongly with our landowners and our sportsmen uh, to address some of these issues. So excited to chat with Veronica tomorrow. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know how it goes. Great. Thank you. Awesome. So let's see who... Tom and Shelly, I think. Yeah, Tom. Uh, just not to leave Neil feeling alone there. Congratulations <laughs> on getting through the uh, season setting. It was always my least favorite time of year. Um, for Mike, I'm a little biased being a biologist uh, and favoring native species. But take that for what it's worth. I certainly favor uh, use of native species, even if it takes replacing a uh, consumptively used non-native. Uh, the one other possible selling point for some of the NIMBYs uh, might be looking at or displaying the percentage of the system that you're actually going to impact. I'm guessing it's, you know, even at your wildest dreams, you're going to impact less than 1% of the entire fishery resources in the area. Um, that's about all I have. Yeah, good, good insight, Tom. I like that. That's a good point. Thank you. Um, who, anyone else? Did I miss anybody? Um, and we've got time here too going through our CAC members. So Jim, Jim member Bo of the public and just interested uh, in everything going on. Any comments from you, Jim Basho? Thanks, Dylan. Um, just a couple of things. Eric mentioned watching the commission meeting at home on his computer and you can do that. And if you register 24 hours ahead of time, you can even comment, but I would encourage anyone to come down to region one headquarters and it's set up there and you can easily comment directly to the commission uh, that way also. So, and there's typically only one or two people there. So take advantage of that option. Um, <clears throat> I would just like to mention, you know, with Flathead Wildlife, a lot of our members are older and not computer savvy. And two things arose. One, uh, you used to be able to buy licenses like a week ahead of before uh, uh, March 1. And now the new policy is they, are, they do not go on sale until March 1. And, and I had a number of members that were not happy with that. <clears throat> they, um, and in fact, I think they went fishing that morning without a license just to prove the point that there was just no way they could legally get a license. And I understand the concern that people might buy the ones for the previous year, but I think with messaging, um, there would be a way to get around that. It would certainly be customer service to try to uh, offer those licenses ahead of time. And I suspect with the aging computer system that a lot of people logged on, <clears throat> first thing in the morning, the computer probably crashed. Um, the other thing I'd mention, again, for those that aren't computer savvy and, and uh, are not loading everything on their phone, uh, we went to the paper tag and to this point, FWP does not want to waste paper. So the tag looks like this. You get three out of a sheet of paper. And when you roll up four or five of those and stick them in your wallet, you have a pretty big lump. And it seems like these could be downsized considerably and still be legible. <clears throat> and that's simply a formatting type issue and be a, a little nicer for those that still want to carry a paper license. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Jim. And yeah, if you come down to our commission meetings, uh, last time Jim brought a bunch of popcorn even. So we don't know if we're gonna keep that. We should try to keep that tradition going. That was fun. But thanks thanks for the input, Jim, and, and for attending tonight. Any other thoughts or comments out there? I, I, it's 
might be the first meeting I've ended on time. So, man, yeah, it's gonna, gonna take us <laughs> a victory lap. Any other input out there? Yeah, Jim, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, since there's a little time, I'll just mention, you know, women are still underrepresented in the outdoors. And so there's some great programs. And last weekend up here, we had Becoming an Outdoors Woman uh, for ice fishing and had 15 women go through that. And they had a great time. And this coming weekend, uh, Lake Mirror Ronan Artemis is going to do a, a full day women's workshop. So those, those kind of things are just great programs. I like to, like to see them introducing new people. One of the people that one of the women's going to help on Saturday actually took the boat program a couple of years ago, and she's now become an instructor. She's just an it's really cool to see that happen. Absolutely. Thanks for teaching those programs, Jim. Very cool. I'm sorry. What is, did you say Artemis? What is that? I don't know if Angie can, it, it's basically a women's uh, outdoor uh, organization. It's nationwide, but Montana has an Artemis chapter and they organize uh, activities and it's a way for women to network and they actually do workshops and, uh, and just in general, make it more, um, uh, make it easier for women to get involved in outdoors and get uh, networked with other women who will likely go out with them. So it's a, it's a really cool program. If you Google it, you'll come up with a lot of information on Artemis. I don't know if Angie, if you're familiar with any, anybody else knows more about it. One of my good friends is a co-founder. Um, they're funded by NWF, just for reference. And uh, as a national coalition, um, it was spawned out of N NWF money. So neat thing. I think there's podcasts and uh, lots of activities, state level chapters across the nation. Yeah, we just met with Burley who's organizing it right before our meeting and got her a bunch of ice fishing. Uh, rods and they're gonna like go to hot springs on Saturday and then go ice that fishing. Been, was like, was talking about, I remember when Burley went on her first excursion ever ice fishing and she had so so much fun. <laughs> oh, she's a pro now. She's just like uh, identifying the Haley's I had on the ice fishing rod. Like, sweet, you guys are gonna have fun. So, very cool. Jim Williams, I guess, uh, take us home. So hopefully this Omicron surge has run its course and things are calm. We'd like to perhaps have two more CAC meetings before we do the summer break. And it'd be nice to end it at Lone Pine with a feast, you know, like we've done in the past. We've had Senator Blaisdell cater and it's just, it's just fun. And I miss the face-to-face. -face. So if things keep progressing better and everyone's um, comfortable, vaccinated, whatever, uh, we'd like to do an in-person meeting again. Um, so that's the goal. So stay tuned. Um, we'll reach out to you on the last two topics. And I got to check in with the director's office, make sure there's uh, no desire on their end for something special or unique as well. But uh, stay tuned. Uh, I thought tonight's presentation, I always love to learn. And uh, I learned a lot tonight, Mike uh, and Matt, you did a great job. And Sokokini Springs came to mind as another possible field trip as well as Summer State Beach, because uh, we got a couple genetics people on CAC right now and and uh, our hatchery manager for native fish is kind of uh, Gregor Mendel uh, there at the hatchery and actually uh, is working to keep nearest neighbors uh, nearest neighbors genetically as well so it's kind of cool stuff but uh, thanks uh, it was a great presentation and actually had pretty good turnout uh, for middle of winter with all these kids sports things going on and uh, so everyone uh, that has to drive drive safe home and uh, hopefully the rain turns to snow again. This is way too early to warm up for me, <laughs> but uh, thank you. Have a Thanks, great everybody. Week. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Thanks.